forests are in the very center of many heated international and national discussions. After all, they cover about one third of our world's land area and are going through major changes due to the increasing human population and changes in global precipitation and temperature patterns. We are talking about forests in climate mitigation, in biodiversity conservation, as living environments of indigenous peoples and as recreational environments of us urban people, and so on. Whatever the discussion around forests is, we always need up-to-date and reliable information on where the forests are located. And quite often, knowing merely the location of the forests is not enough. We also need information on their characteristics. How tall are the trees? What is the woody or green biomass of an area? Which tree species are present? And increasingly, there is interest in characteristics which are not traditionally demanded by the forest industry, such as leaf area and leaf pigments, indicators of photosynthetic processes in canopies, um, the condition of forest floor vegetation and presence of berries, and various indicators of interactions between forests and the atmosphere. I believe uh, many of us have observed some changes in these characteristics of forests in our own living environments. In Finland, in general, the landscape has become more forested due to the draining of peatlands and conversion of agricultural lands to forests during the past five decades. This, of course, is not the case everywhere in the world. It's impossible to see large-scale or global changes in forests if we're just standing here on Earth. And that's why we need to travel upwards and look down at Earth from airborne or spaceborne platforms. In just uh, three human generations, we've gone through an amazing transition in using space technology to monitor forest resources. From a very early age, I recall my late father talking about one of his fondest childhood memories. It was Sputnik and how he and his aunt stood gazing into the cold and dark October night sky in 1957, trying to spot the very first satellite sent into space. To common people, Sputnik represented perhaps space exploration, excitement or even fear but not so much an opportunity to monitor our planet's natural resources. At that time, information on global forest resources was very scarce. It was mainly collected by sending questionnaires to those countries which happened to have a professional forest inventory system at that time. Some 30 years later, it was the time for my childhood at that time, there were already several designated satellite missions for collecting images of the Earth. International forest resource assessments were commonly carried out using uh, spatial and statistical modeling based on field plot data collected from forests. Some preliminary tests for using satellite data to estimate forest variables were also starting to go on. To the kids of the ongoing decade, satellite images are already somewhat part of their everyday life. When my son's uh, friend moved to Brussels, his kindergarten class took out an iPad, opened Google Earth and looked at satellite images from Brussels. They located a couple of parks and looked at what the route from Helsinki to Brussels might look like. So to them, uh, satellite images are not that special anymore. Um, forest resources uh, for many countries are now routinely generated using satellite data. And we also have a time series of more than 40 years of uh, satellite images available for looking at 
large-scale changes in global vegetation. There's a very rapid increase in the amount of satellite data available for environmental monitoring. And that's one reason why services such as Google Earth are becoming familiar to people who would otherwise have nothing to do with remote sensing. Looking at satellite images is no longer a privilege only experts have. A free, soft, uh, free satellite data are available to anyone, and so are free software for analyzing them. Currently, there are nearly 700 satellites doing some sort of Earth-observing activities. That's, of course, great news, but at the same time, we have to remember that not all the data generated by these satellites are appropriate for all environmental applications. There are actually quite a few limitations to that and that the interpretation methods for these satellite images still require plenty of development. This has been very much a technology-driven field, where the focus has been on developing better sensors and platforms. However, our scientific understanding of the data itself, the satellite images, is still rather weak. I claim that during the past two decades, the international remote sensing community has focused too much on purely empirical studies and real theoretical developments are lagging behind. And that's one of the challenges my team is trying to tackle. So what are uh, satellite images like? Here's an example of an optical satellite image from central Finland, which has been captured by a relatively new European satellite sensor called Sentinel-2. It's a very typical Finnish landscape of forests, lakes, agricultural fields, and some roads. Here on the left, you see the same satellite image, a true color one, something a, a human eye would see. And um, optical satellite images can actually be divided into several layers, which represent different wavelengths. And by analyzing data in these different wavelengths, we are able to identify different surfaces on Earth and estimate variables describing them. Here's another example of a slightly different satellite image. It has been captured um, by the Hyperion sensor, which has over 220 spectral bands, or layers, which form a hyperspectral data cube that you see here on the left. I selected uh, two pixels from the image and extracted the spectra for them. And you can see the spectra here in the middle. And what you notice is that the spectra of these two pixels are quite different. They represent a young birch forest and a mature pine forest. When I talk about interpretation of optical satellite image, I mean, for example, the application of different spectral analysis methods to retrieve properties of targets from the data, such as structural variables describing these forests. My research, team, my research team's uh, long-term goal is to understand better how the reflected signal that optical satellite sensors measure from vegetated areas is formed, and how we can use this information in understanding the shortwave radiation budget of vegetated areas on Earth. We work at multiple scales, starting from tiny leaves and needles to shoots, trees, forests, and entire vegetated landscapes. The first step in this work is understanding the optical properties of single leaves and needles. This is especially challenging for our northern tree species, which have very thin needles that are difficult to measure and handle. My team has been working on developing more appropriate methods for measuring spectral properties of coniferous needles, and I'm happy to say that we published so far the most extensive spectral library on these tree species in the world. The next step is to look at the spectral properties of single trees. We've been 
pioneering on this in very controlled uh, lab environments using um, artificial light and spectrometers. And here you can see uh, my postdoc in, in action. Since forests are not composed only of trees, we're also looking at the spectral properties of the forest floor vegetation. Now, this information is something we can perhaps use in better detection of berries from remote sensing data. Here you can see uh, some of my team members collecting ground reference data last summer with uh, plenty of uh, flying friends with them there. We're not only looking at the spectral properties, but also the structural properties. And uh, we're currently developing a hierarchical concept for modeling complex vegetation structures, such as, for example, coniferous canopies. Um, here is a work of my doctoral student in progress. He collected some point cloud data of, uh, of trees with a terrestrial laser scanner in order to be able to model the detailed structure of these crowns. Eventually, all these different uh, steps will contribute to developing a spectral scaling model, which can be used for quite versatile applications. One application could be that it helps us to estimate variables describing both the tree layer and forest floor layer uh, vegetation using optical satellite data. There are many groups working on remote sensing in the world, and as a community, we are expecting more and more satellite data to become available for uh, mapping applications within the next few years. It does look like we have a very bright future ahead of us for spaceborne monitoring of forests if we also dedicate enough efforts to the theoretical developments and proper validation of new methods with ground reference data. Thank you.